Hey there, it's Andrea, and welcome to the Voice of Influence podcast. Today I have with me Gail Williams. Gail is the clinical director of At Ease USA. Uh, At Ease is committed to providing access to confidential trauma treatment and support for active military, veterans, frontline healthcare workers, and their loved ones, regardless of their ability to pay. At Ease complements existing services offered by the military and veterans organizations with a focus on the elimination of barriers to treatment for those suffering from the effects of PTSD. Gail, I'm so glad to have you here today on the I'm Voice excited. of Influence podcast. Yes, thank you. I'm excited to be here. Thank you for the invite. Yes. Okay. So the work that you guys do so, so important. Would you tell us a little bit about the model of at ease and how kind of its inception? How did it start? Sure. So if I can take you back to 20, 2007, um, Scott Anderson, who's a local businessman, um, was watching all of our veterans come back or our military members come back from Iraq. And he had heard some research and studies through the VA that one third um, of the population who were struggling with PTSD, less than a third of them, I should say, received any treatment from the VA for their PTSD. And so, you know, there's lots of barriers, whether it's they just don't want to, there's some trust factors, um, you know, with military members, they, they're tough and strong. And so they persevere and, and push through. And so because of that issue, Scott founded At Ease USA to open up confidential, privately funded um, services, therapeutic services for military active duty and also veterans. Can you tell us a little bit about PTSD? You know, we've all heard that that acronym. I think we all kind of have this image in our mind of what that means. But would you kind of give us a picture of what that looks like or how, how do even sure. somebody find out that they have it? Right. So I think a lot of times people use the word trauma in synony synonymous with PTSD, and they're not one in the same. Someone could experience trauma, but not necessarily have post-traumatic stress. And so what we look for is prolonged activation of symptoms. So if you're experiencing after having exposure to some trauma, if you're having symptoms after a month or two months, and sometimes it can even last years if not treated, then it's likely that you are suffering from PTSD. Some of those symptoms can include things like sadness, fear, anger. And so sometimes it's hard to diagnose because you think that might just be depression or anxiety, but there's some other factors um, that play into this as well when we're talking about PTSD, avoidance of sleep sometimes because they're afraid of nightmares or sometimes just sleeping throughout the day or any time that they can to avoid having to feel. Um, in extreme cases, there's been loss of memory, forgetfulness, and also disassociation. So the best way to find out whether or not you have PTSD, and keep in mind it's a spectrum, so someone can have PTSD, but it may not be that severe. But to get a diagnosis, it, it would require going to a clinician, a mental health provider, and taking a PTSD assessment. And you mentioned disassociating, and I think that that might be something that people aren't totally aware of as well. Could you explain what disassociation yeah. looks like? Yeah, it shows up, and sometimes people could describe it as, oh, I have ADHD. So a lot of times when I'm also a clinician, and so a lot of times when I was in my private practice, I would ask questions that relate to ADHD, but also questions that relate to trauma, because sometimes it could mask this trauma. So it would be you know, a little bit of checking in and out, you know, spacing off those kinds of things. And then in, in more extreme cases, it's really where you're not present in your body. You, you're you not aware of your surroundings. You're not really fully grounded is what I call it. And so that happens quite frequently when you have been exposed to traumatic events. Hmm. Um, what does at ease do exactly? What is the model? Yes, thank you. So we first started with contracting with WCA and also Lutheran Family Services in the early in the early days to provide treatment for our veterans and women veterans at the WCA. And then we recently, over the last few years, expanded to invite 
contract therapists throughout the state of Nebraska, because our goal is to grow throughout the state and into Iowa. And then my goal as a clinical director, hopefully throughout the years, would be to expand in other states. But right now we're focused on Nebraska, those rural areas where access to care is very difficult. And so we have providers in North Platte, we have a provider in Gothenburg, Harney, you know, all of these other rural areas. And we're still looking as well um, because we have, we know that we have veteran populations out there as well. I understand that sometimes it takes a, some sort of, I don't know, outside force or, or even a, a major problem to, for somebody to take a hard look at the fact that maybe they are experiencing mental health struggles that would be helped by counseling. Um, have you noticed that as well? And, and what, what helps people to kind of get over that either stigma or just that hump of, of reaching out for help? Yes. Thank you for that question. I think it's a combination of things. There's a stigma, but there's also fear in general um, about exposing, about having to face, you know, whatever it is that you, that you've been trying trying to avoid facing. And I not only with the veteran population, I think in, in general, especially in minority populations, counseling has not been something that's been um, acceptable. And, you know, usually in some minority communities, it's, you know, you just go to church and you pray about it and then it's fine. Um, and so I, I think just the stigma of if you go to therapist you're not able to handle it on your own, which means something is really wrong with you. And I completely disagree. My motto is come before there's a big problem, right? So it's almost, it's it's like having a coach, so to speak, with a medical license to help or a therapeutic license to help. And, you know, to get through this life, especially over the last few years of the things that we've experienced, it would be really nice to have someone in your corner who's unbiased and, and who can walk you through some things and also help you because I believe also that we all have the answers within us, but we just need someone to hold space and have that quiet time and reflective time. And we don't get those opportunities very often. So it, to answer your question in terms of like the stigma, I think that we need to continue the conversations like you're doing today. It's so nice to have a platform to talk about mental wellness. I use that term because People, you know, think of mental health as something bad. So I try to change the lingo a little bit and say mental wellness, and we all need it. Um, I think everyone should at some point in their life have a therapist before the problem becomes a problem. Hmm. So when somebody goes to therapy for the first time, what should they expect? Well, I think it's important for the person who is seeking services to feel comfortable and obviously, when you first meet someone, you're not going to be 100% comfortable. But if you have a good rapport and you feel like this is a good match, that is half the battle. Because if I've heard this time and time again, uh, when people access services, they just didn't click with their therapist. And so yeah. therefore, they're not open. And I always say, if you're not honest with yourself first and then with the person who's helping we can't get much done. And so I think the first thing that they have to look for is making sure they feel connection. And again, they're not going to pour their heart out necessarily on the first you know, meeting or session, but if they can feel some sense of this person, I think could get me, I, I think this person, you know, um, understands where I'm coming from and can relate. Hmm. I think that's helpful to know um, for folks just to have an idea of what even they're walking into, you know? Yeah. I say it's like dating. It really is. You have to, you know, try out a couple and just see, and, and there's, there's nothing wrong with that. I am not offended. I, you know, I say whoever's meant for me to help and, and whoever I'm supposed to work with, let them come and who I'm not supposed to work with, let them find their person because I'm not for everyone. And so I want to encourage people not to be shy about shopping around. It's important. This is your life or your, your family's lives that we're talking about. So take initiative to find the right fit for you. Hmm. What advice do you have for somebody who might be a family member? Might They might know somebody that they really care about. They can see that they're struggling and there's a, you know, maybe either they, they are a veteran or maybe they're not, but you probably would have some helpful advice for us. Um, if we're seeing that somebody's struggling, how to be a support to them. Absolutely. And you're right. It's not just veterans. It's you know, I think it's just our, our world in general could use some support and assistance. And when you're facing 
the issues of PTSD, post-traumatic stress, uh, it can be difficult and it's a family issue. And so oftentimes the person who is impacted directly by that PTSD may not want to seek services. And everything that the family member says or does or tries to coerce them into, into going is not working. What I would say to the family member is then you get in. You go get the support, you get the help that you need so that you can better understand all of these symptoms, how you can ground yourself, you know, how you can learn some different coping skills, and maybe that will influence your partner or spouse or whoever it is, family member down the road when they see that you're able to, you know, get access to services for yourself and your behavior changes. Hmm. There is something so powerful. I mean, we've been in family situations before with counseling. And it's so helpful for those around the person who's struggling. I mean, everybody's kind of struggling Mm -hmm. um, when that happens. And just to have some understanding of how to better serve them, you know, to Mm -hmm. love them well and, and understand them is so so important. Yes, absolutely. And I think conversations come up in therapy that don't otherwise come up. That's true. And then oftentimes there's some emotions that are involved. And, you know, I do couples therapy as well. But when you're when you're in a room alone trying to hash out whatever issues or, or conflict there may be, sometimes it's hard to do alone. And, and it's nice to have a mediator to say, OK, hold on. What did you hear? You know, and, and then be able to coach them through those conversations. So you're right. There's a lot of powerful things that can happen in family therapy. And, and we love to work with veterans and their families, um, not just the one who is directly impacted by the PTSD, but their family members, whether children or spouses or even parents of service members, too. I have two boys that are serving right now. And, you know, I if they ever needed it, I would be there in a heartbeat. Okay. So Gail, you said you, that you are a clinician yourself, but you're also running this, you're, you're the director of at ease. How did you get into that role? Like what, how did that come about? Yes. Thank you. So years ago, I believe it was 2016 at ease USA was providing some training uh, for clinicians throughout the state and it's specialized training for trauma and PTSD, which is called EMDR. It stands for Eye Movement Desensitization and Reprocessing. And so they were going to, I think it was around 20 clinicians, they were going to pay for their training and hopes that they would also be able to help our our veterans and military members. And so in 2016, I'd heard about it and reached out to them and they'd already filled up their roster. And so I just said, you know, I, I would love to be on it if it ever comes back around. And I didn't wait. I went and got my own training. But a year later, the president of the board reached out to me and asked to meet and asked if I would be interested in being on the board. And I love military affairs. I'm I'm from a military family background. And so I jumped on board, um, literally on the board and served for about five years, four and a half years to five years. And when this position came open, we interviewed for six months to find someone to fill the position and we couldn't find someone with the military background with the trauma education with you know the experience with ptsd and so i asked to step off the board and and see if you know i could grow this program and really get to as many military members and veterans as possible you're you were saying too, that this is supplementary to what the military is already doing. I would imagine that there's some people wondering what is, what does the military do for veterans and, um, you know, and, and their families when it comes to mental health, what, what is, what do they do and why does this need to be supplemented? Sure. So a lot of the services that veterans receive is through the VA hospital. And, you know, there's, there's a few factors. One is, capacity, you know, and so they may not be able to serve because they don't have enough openings and veterans will have to wait a long time to get in. And then there's, you know, obviously some trust factors, I think, with some veterans too. And so this is where we come in. I mentioned earlier that we are fully funded privately. And so we are not necessarily linked to any government organization or affiliations at all. Um, We would take referrals from the VA if they sent us someone and they couldn't see them. And so, you know, we we just supplement where they are not able to access mental health care services. 
Um, on top of that, we have trauma-informed yoga that comes around um, every so often. We've got one going on right now and give you a little bit of information at the end about those um, yoga and then self-defense. And then we have peer support as well. Um, we've taken a little bit of a break with peer support. And if you're not familiar with that, it's a great program because the peer support worker is someone who has lived shared experiences as the military member or veteran, and they understand the lifestyle, they hold groups, and then sometimes they do one-on-one. -on -one. So if a veteran is struggling with finding, finding a good job or employment, this peer support worker can help them in that effort. Hmm. So those are some of the support services that we provide. Hmm. Now, I know that there is still inside of the military, there's still plenty of stigma around seeking help. Mm -hmm. um, I wonder what thoughts you have about that and advice you have to both people in the military who are, who know that they're struggling, but don't feel like they can or should reach out. Mm -hmm. And then also just if you could say anything to the powers that be in the military about how to better handle that problem, what would you say? I might get myself in trouble here, but I think that there is a stigma because from from my personal experience with family members and friends, you know, the thought is if I seek help, I'm not fit for duty. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I'm from the thought that you should get help so you are fit for duty. Um, and so this that would be my plea to the higher ups or, or you know, the forces that say to encourage getting mental wellness so that you can be the best soldier or airman or whatever it is. And, you know, I think people wait too long and then it's when, you know, the military member may be activated in terms of emotions and suicidal or things like that. We don't want it to get to that point. So if we start creating this, this culture of psychological safety is what I call it, then we could prevent some of these veteran suicides. We probably could intervene a lot quicker. And so that's my hope is to get people to encourage it, but not just say it, but really mean it. You know, there's no punitive damages or um, repercussions from seeking services. But again, this is where Ad Ease USA comes in because we we don't report to anyone. And so mm -hmm. service members can come and, and visit with us. What they tell their their superiors or their doctors is up to them. Um, so we just, we provide, as we said, confidential and hopefully eliminate all barriers to, to services. Oh, that's so great. I mean, I, I know that, I mean, I've seen many programs out there in the military and specifically with the air force. I know that they're talking about the suicide is a bigger enemy right now than any other. There's, that's the biggest killer of, of, Mm -hmm. um, of military members, especially the air force. And I, it's just heartbreaking that that would be the case. It is so heartbreaking. So I'm not sure what the statistics are in 2023, but the last I checked, it was 22 a day. And mm -hmm. then it fluctuates between 18 and 22, but that's 18 and 22 too many. Oh yeah. You know, and it, you know, these, a lot of these, these men and women come in young and they're mm. giving their lives to serve the country and and for them to feel the impact of, and it's not just wartime. And there's some other things that happen in the military that cause trauma and PTSD. I mean, there's military sexual trauma, male and female, it happens to. And there's a lot of things, you know, there's like any community. I mean, there's bullying, there's, you know, other things like that, that could cause trauma and PTSD. So you know, I think it's important that, again, we continue the conversation so that people know that there is help out there and that they can feel better, that they don't have to live that way and feel that way mm. forever. But again, that, that, like you said, the suicide rate is, it's saddening um, that it's that high. It's just, yeah, it's, it is saddening. Um, when it comes to more of the business leadership side of being, um, the leader of a nonprofit, um, how would you describe your own sort of leadership style? I know that you're working with the board and you're working with other basically vendors, people who are um, providing services and I assume uh, donors, like what, how would you describe your own leadership? Well, we're 
if we're going to use terms that people are familiar with, I would say more like transformational and servant leadership. Because I believe when you're collaborative and um, you are curious and inquisitive about other people's opinions and, and what other people are doing and really invested in who they are, that you're, you're going to get, you know, everything that you're looking for as a leader. People will want to work with you or for you rather than feeling like they have to, if that makes sense. Oh, yeah. Oh, okay. Definitely makes sense to me. Yeah. <laughs> it's definitely something that I talk a lot okay. about. Um, and I guess in, since we're talking about that in particular, we do a lot of work around personal agency that feeling that, that sense of what I do and what I say, it matters. It carries weight. Mm -hmm. What impact do you see personal agency feeling like what I, I, I can have an impact on my situation or where I'm at? How do you see that impacting PTSD? Well, hugely. I mean, not just PTSD, but any aspect of a person's life where, you know, they, they want to feel inclusive. I think that that's, you know, some of the missing pieces when people don't feel love accepted and, you know, um, included or connected. Right. And so when you work with or for someone, or even in a family, if you don't feel like you have a voice, if you don't feel like your opinions matter or are important, important. Um, it's going to be hard to navigate those relationships. So I'm excited that you incorporate that within your own, own company, because that's how you get top results. You get more productivity, you get, you know, better outcomes, um, whatever your company is, you're going to see better results when you invest that into the people that you work with. Hmm. Um, nonprofit board chair, Slack and it, that that relationship that you have with your nonprofit board chair that's it's always an interesting dynamic. Can you tell us about the the way that relationship is structured for at ease? So the board we have twelve members right now on the board, and we try to get from all different industries and also consider you know diversity inclusion and equity as well and so right now we have the board president the vice president the secretary and the treasurer um, and then we're working on succession planning and things like that as as normal boards would do and my role right now is shifted because i used to be president of the board vice president then president and then i just recently stepped off and so now that i'm an actual employee of the organization my my relationship with the board is different. And so I, I don't do as many board activities, but report to the board and, you know, report out on, on our data and our progress and things like that for the program. And what kind of support do they provide you? They Well, they're amazing. And so it is an active working board. When I was on the board, I felt like it, it could have been a second job at times because it's a small, you know, working organization where, a, a heavy, deep, um, small but mighty two team organization. It's a two people organization. So it's myself and the executive director. And we do depend on our board members to be invested. Most, if not all, have some sort of military affiliation. And so the heart and the passion is there. And, you know, we, we have committees that they look over the finances or they help with program development. We have a marketing and fundraising committee. And so they are really active in helping support this mission of growth for at ease. Hmm. That's great. What challenges or opportunities do you see in the rest of 2023 for you guys? Yeah. So I appreciate being here with you because this is one of our biggest challenges is awareness, brand awareness, people understanding and knowing what we do, because a lot of times we'll go to events, you know, um, like these fairs and we'll have a table and people will say, I've never heard of Addie's USA. This is amazing. And I'm going, oh my gosh, how do we get this out here to the masses? And even in the rural, you know, counties and, and towns too, how do, how do we get to them and let them know that we're here and that we're ready to serve them? Mm. So our biggest challenge is the marketing and the brand awareness part. Mm. And what about opportunities? And opportunities are unlimited. I mean, we we have 24 providers right now across the state, which is amazing. And we're still adding. And so, you know, anytime a 
therapist comes across a veteran, and this is what I've been trying to push. This is an opportunity. And the provider doesn't take TRICARE, which is the military insurance, or the deductible is too high and the, the military member can't pay for it. They typically don't, they won't engage in services because of those reasons. So that's where we come in. And I want to encourage therapists who are turning away veterans or military members because they don't take TRICARE to connect with me. Mm. And let's talk about being a preferred provider is what we call our network of providers. And see if you if you meet the criteria, which is just you have some sort of evidence-based model of treating trauma and PTSD, um, that you have an affiliation, some sort of affiliation with the military. That's important. Um, and really, that's about it. So we opportunities, again, uh, I think as long as we continue these conversations and letting people know that we're out here, that the opportunities will continue to come. Mm. What else do you want the public to know about At Ease? Well, we're an organization that really is being progressive. So we strictly treat PTSD. Our our goal is to eliminate it. Um, And it doesn't have to last forever. You get good treatment, you get quick and early treatment. Um, That obviously helps in all settings, right? Quick and early. Um, And so we want to make sure that we're trying to address that problem for not only the the member who is suffering with PTSD, but the family members too. Because as I said earlier, it's a family, it becomes a family issue. And so we will try to work with all families and, and military members to eliminate any barriers that get in their way, whether it's location, because we offer telehealth services, whether it's financial barriers, anything like that. We are working on transportation as well. Um, We're writing grants and asking for a vehicle so that we can drive to these rural counties and our peer support specialists can go and meet them where they are. So um, those are, those are things I want people to know that we're, we're working on because we see the need and, and we're aware of it and we're, we're hoping to expand so that we can get to as many people as possible. Hmm. I, I'm just, I'm struck by how important it is. There's so many, there's so many residual effects when we're struggling and with, when anybody's struggling, there's ripple effects and it's not anybody's fault, but oh my, it matters. This stuff really matters. matters. Yeah. And, you know, again, it's, it is, it's not just the person struggling with PTSD who suffers, it's everyone around. Because a lot of times that dealing with PTSD on your own looks, looks like you're isolating, it looks silent, or it looks like you're lashing out and you're angry and you don't want to deal with people. So of course, the people around you who love you don't know what to do, and they're upset and they're hurting as well. So sometimes that can can create secondary trauma, you know, to the other person. Yes. Yes. Um, you know, I was talking with someone else who experienced child abuse and, um, and one of the things in that conversation was sort of that, that, um, the trauma that came afterwards Mm -hmm. was almost worse to experience is it is really difficult in the first place. But then to have anybody deny, you know, deny or just want you to get better, not want to have to deal with it, you know, start to blame the victim kind of thing. All those things are so impactful in a negative way. Yeah, it adds on top of that trauma, right? And then this is where you see a lot more of the depression and anxiety come in because they can't trust, you know if someone does open up and starts talking about it and it's not received, as you said, you know, denial or just, just get over it, that creates a whole nother set of issues. And so, yeah, it's important to understand that people need support and you may not, as a family member, you probably aren't the best one to provide the mental wellness support. You can provide, you know, emotional and social support, but that other piece needs to come from someone who is not part of the family, someone who is unbiased and trained to be able to help with those things. Because I think family members, this is why ethically uh, licensed clinicians, we're not allowed to see our own families because we would probably not do very well. I'm, I'm sure of it. There's just too much history and too many emotions involved. So, you know, kudos to family members who are supporting 
people with PTSD and at the same time, get yourself some support and then also encourage your member to get some support outside of yourself. Yeah. So Gail, what do you have, what do you have in store? What are, what, what's coming up or, or how can people get a hold of you and at, at ease to even begin their journey? Absolutely. So whether you're a provider interested in learning more about becoming a preferred provider in our network, you can reach me at 531-247-4040, extension 2, or you can email Gail, which is G-A-I-L, with the at sign, and then at easeusa.org. So providers can contact me that way, but also anyone who's interested in services, who is a military member or are retired or veteran, or even frontline healthcare worker, they can use that information to get a hold of me as well. Um, we do have some classes coming up here. The first one is women's only self-defense, which is pretty cool. Um, Jason Miner is the instructor. He's a jujitsu master and a 20 year um, Air Force veteran. So he's been doing classes. He did the first one a couple of weeks ago. And then it's on Sunday afternoons from, I believe it's 12 to 1.30. And the next one will be on 521. The next one is 625. And then the last one would be on 723. He has them spread out. He's pretty busy. He comes down from Lincoln to offer these free services for military members and their families. So that's And this is in exciting. Omaha? This is in Omaha at our location on um, Old Mill area. We're off of 108th and Old Mill. And there's a gym attached to this building. And so they just use the mats there. And yeah, it's quite interesting. That's cool. So that's one thing we have coming up. The other thing is the trauma-informed yoga, and that's open for, it's co-ed. And again, for military members and healthcare workers, it's free. There's a nominal fee. If if anyone wants to join either of these, the self-defense or yoga, there's a nominal fee if you're not a military member or healthcare worker. Um, and that is provided by Sarah Lively, who is um, certified through the VETS um, Yoga Project. So it's pretty exciting. It's it's trauma-informed yoga. So it's very easy on the body. It's really about listening to your body and listening to your breath and not stretching yourself too far, but just enough. It, it creates that mindfulness and that grounded feeling. So that's coming up on Sunday, Mother's Day. It's a special Mother's Day. And that's from two to three. And the next one will be on 521. Actually, that will be the last yoga trauma-informed yoga class. And they can all register online, too, if they just want to quick um, send in a registry. It's www.easeusa.org. And then you just go to programs and you'll see all of the things that we have, including those two events. Great. Um, okay, my my last question for you, Gail, is this is the Voice of Influence podcast. So what last piece of advice would you like to give someone who would really like to have a voice of influence? A voice of influence. I love that name, first of all. And, I, you know, we've talked about this before in a, in a leadership group that we, we did. But, you know, a lot of times people are afraid to speak up, afraid to say what matters to them. And we say, just do it afraid. I know people have heard that term, but do it afraid. And the more often you do it afraid, the less afraid you become. Because you realize that, you know, I can speak up and the world doesn't end and, you know, the sky doesn't fall. It, it's fine. And I think people have to also realize that not everybody's going to agree with you, just as you don't always agree with everyone else, right? And that's okay. But stay true to yourself. And if it's not something that needs to be explored or even in a relationship, I'm not talking about leadership necessarily, but even in a relationship, make sure that you each have voices of influence, that everybody has opportunities to know their truth and speak their truth without retribution or without judgment. And that's hard to do as human beings because we're judgy people. And so just having this, I call it the Q, a curious mind. So the C is, is being curious and the U is understanding and the E is having empathy. And not to say that you can exactly feel how that person feels, try to acknowledge at least, okay, I can see how that would be whatever it is. And also celebrate others' wins. Make sure that you do that because I think that goes a long way. And some people may take that as, well, if I'm complimenting them, what if I don't get a compliment back? That can be kind of vulnerable and risky. So what? 
do it anyway. That's a way to be influential. The more people feel appreciated by you, the more influ influential you can be. Yes. I love it. All the things. Thank you so much, Gail, for being a voice Thank of influence you. for the, the listeners today and, and um, for the work that you're doing with at ease. Greatly Thank appreciate you so it. much. Thank you so much.